Welcome to the Diet Doctor Podcast with Dr. Brett Schur. Today I'm joined by Dr. Georgia Ede. Georgia is a, is a trained psychiatrist and has worked as a general psychiatrist for years, but through her own personal challenges and finding nutrition as a treatment for her, she started to use it with her patients. And she's got a, fa a fantastic story about how she sort of progressed from Harvard to Smith College and now to sort of nutritional consulting, uh, her challenges along the way and her successes along the way, and how she's reframed how she thinks about treating psych psychiatric diseases. But she's not just an expert in psychiatric diseases. She is a breath of fresh air in terms of how she helps us understand nutritional research and nutritional news and the, the forces behind it and how we can incorporate that into our lives and understand the complexities of it. So we, we talk quite a bit about that in this interview. So hopefully you'll walk away from this interview with some specific suggestions of, of how to see uh, nutritional news and also how to think about psychiatric conditions is not so different from the rest of our body and how insulin resistance, um, prediabetes, how it plays a role in our bodies and in our minds. Uh, so I hope you really enjoy this uh, interview with Dr. Georgia Ede. And if you want to see the transcripts, you can find those on dietdoctor.com as well as the rest of our previous podcast episodes. All right. Thank you very much and enjoy this episode. Dr. Georgia Ede, thank you so much for joining me on the Diet Doctor podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on because you represent this world that seems so different than the rest of the low-carb world, but really shouldn't be, right? It's the world of the brain, the world of psychiatry, the world of how we think and mental disorders. But in reality, it's not that much different, is it? The brain is part of the body. Most <laughs> studies do agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting way to put it. So you were trained as a psychiatrist, which means you were trained to prescribe medications for psychiatric diseases. So just as a quick recap, was there any discussion of nutritional therapies in your psychiatry training? No, uh, psychiatry residency training, four years, not a word about nutrition in four years. Right. And then you went on to work at Harvard as a psychiatrist. And I've heard your story many times, and it's an amazing story, how through your own health challenges, you came to find the low-carb way of living, which really reversed your own health challenges. And then you decided, maybe I can apply this to my patients as well. And what did you initially see when you started to apply nutritional therapies to your patients seeing you for, or for mental disorders? I think the most predictable thing I've seen uh, in the beginning and, and all the way through is two things usually improve. Um, one is anxiety levels tend to come down. And another is that people who tend to overeat or binge eat, or even people with bulimia who meet criteria, diagnostic criteria for bulimia, which is not just binging, but also purging, um, the low carbohydrate diet can be very, very effective for controlling ap uh, urges to binge because it so nicely regulates appetite and cravings. Well, that's interesting because we frequently hear when people say who should not go on a low carb diet or, or a restrictive quote unquote diet, frequently the topic of eating disorders comes up. But here you're saying it's potentially useful specifically in eating disorders. Yes, with the caveat that we want to be careful about anorexia. So the eating disorder anorexia, of course, most people with anorexia, but not all, are underweight. And most people with anorexia um, are very, very afraid to eat fat. Mm. And so if you recommend a low-carbohydrate diet for somebody with anorexia, I mean, obviously you wouldn't do that to help them lose weight because that's not a goal. But let's say that you were thinking maybe a low-carbohydrate diet, a more nutrient-dense diet, a higher-calorie diet would help them uh, resolve the actual, um, the, the thinking that go, goes behind anorexia, the disordered thinking. Um, the problem with that approach is that um, if it, what can happen is that the person may, of course, um, not be willing to increase their fat intake. So you're now you've taken away another macronutrient and now there, there's very little left for them to eat. So in approaching anorexia, um, it has to be done very, very carefully. And in fact, I, I've never uh, yet had that experience of working with somebody with anorexia um, and applying a low carbide diet. It would, it would have to be very, very carefully done and with, and on a team. Right, right, yeah. right. So important to differentiate when people talk about eating disorders is not just one thing. There, there are different areas there. But again, no matter what, when you're starting um, nutritional therapy to treat 
any psychiatric condition, it seems like probably not the best thing to do on your own and, and, and start trying to wean off your medications. Best to do under clinical supervision and expert guidance. That's absolutely right. That's a really, really good point. Uh, you know, because low carbohydrate diets are very safe uh, uh, options for most people. Um, but if you are taking a psychiatric medication, or really any medication, but a psychiatric medication in particular, um, when you're starting a low carbohydrate diet, um, especially the first few days, it's a very powerful metabolic intervention. And therefore, your body chemistry changes very quickly in very positive, healthy ways. But um, that can have an effect on your medication levels. And so if you're taking a medication uh, where levels are important, like lithium, a mood stabilizer, or Depakote, another mood stabilizer, then it's very, very important to work closely with somebody who knows what they're doing to help monitor those levels and regulate them. And I do have a free article on psychology today, um, ketogenic diets and psychiatric medications to help guide clinicians as well as patients uh, through that process, give them some, some uh, tips. Very interesting. Okay. Now getting back to sort of your path through this, through this maze of nutrition for psychiatric health. Uh, so you're at Harvard and you start instituting nutritional recommendations to help treat your patients seeking care for, for a psychiatric diagnosis. And from what I've heard, the I guess you could say the institution wasn't so favorable favorable about that. Well, at first they were, you know. So I was there for seven years, and for the first six or so years, they were very supportive of my incorporating nutrition into my work. Um, and many students, particularly graduate students and some of the faculty patients, were very interested and motivated to change their diet. Um, but then there was a change in leadership uh, after that sixth year, and the new director came on and she's no longer there, but the new director came on and said, uh, you know, uh, we don't want you to do this anymore. This is beyond the scope of psychiatric practice. And I was forced to stop. And that's one of the reasons that I left. Yeah. I mean, and hearing it now, it just seems so short-sighted to say that nutrition has, basically saying nutrition has no role in the treatment of psychiatric diseases. Well, I don't know if that was her thinking. Um, she at least thought that psychiatrists shouldn't be involved in giving uh, nutritional advice. And, and, you know, I guess to be fair, psychiatrists don't have any training in nutrition. We would right. have to seek it out ourselves. And so I guess there's some logic there, but I, uh, it was unfortunate. Right. That makes sense. So what, what authority do you have to recommend nutritional therapies? Well, exactly. Right. What authority does anybody have, though, because who's trained in nutritional therapies for psychiatric diseases? Not many people. No Nobody. MDs are trained in nutrition and therefore no MD should be giving nutrition advice. I don't understand how that right. works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then you transition from Harvard over to Smith College. Mm -hmm. And here's where I think the story gets even more interesting because it's already very interesting, but even more interesting because now you're in an environment where people have not so much control over their foods. They're living in dormitories. Um, Health and nutrition is not on the forefront of most college people's mind. Uh, it's an all women's college in a fairly liberal college where I would imagine a vegetarian bias was probably fairly present when you got there. Mm -hmm. So tell me about your, your years there and sort of the struggles you found, the challenges you found, and some of the successes you saw in working with that type of a population. Yeah, so it really was challenging. First of all, I, I loved working with students at Smith, and um, and you're right. I, you know, most of the students that I saw, um, their physical health wasn't necessarily their top priority. Their mental health, of course, was, and that's why they were coming in. Um, but uh, you know, I asked every single student. This was part of my intake interview. Um, every student I met with. Uh, the same question, do you eat a special diet of any kind? And I documented, you know, what, what their answer was. And, and, uh, when they were actually very high percentage, I, if I remember correctly, about 8% of my students ate a vegan diet, um, even higher percentage of vegetarian diet. And, you know, for the most part, not for health reasons actually, but for compassionate reasons. Hmm. And so, um, you know, because of, you know, the treatment of animals and so forth and and I, you know, that's an argument, that's an emotional argument that's very hard, uh, very hard to respond to. Uh, and I, and I didn't try because I, I think it's a, it's a valid point. But uh, when it came to their mental health, I, it was my job as a, as an educated, and as their doctor and as an educated person in nutrition to explain to them uh, either that they would need to very carefully supplement their diet, which 
I, I, I didn't meet a single person eating a vegan diet who was supplementing properly mm. um, or that they would uh, might want to consider including uh, an, some animal foods in their diet, even if it was, you know, shellfish. So um, that was my that was my approach. Um, but of course, uh, th- that was unsuccessful. In five years, I wasn't able to convince any any of my students to in, uh, incorporate any animal foods into their diet. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. And did you see a lack of progress that was sort of frustrating you in terms of how they were doing? Well, you know, that's a hard question because m- almost all of my students were struggling with, uh, well, all of them were struggling with mental health problems. And, uh, you know, the the nutritional quality of a diet has is not just about whether or not a person eats animal foods. It's about how much junk food they're eating right, right. primarily. And the vast majority of my students were eating a lot of processed food. So whether you eat plants or animals or both, that's the main thing that's going to be interrupting normal brain chemistry. And that's that was really the thing that I was up against. That was the hardest uh, uh, thing to work with students around. So traditional teaching in medical school and in, in probably psych, psychiatric residency and internal medicine residency is depression. It has to do with serotonin or it has to do with dopamine or norepinephrine. And it's, it's just a chemical imbalance that we're sort of hardwired. And therefore the only real treatment is drugs that will counteract those chemical imbalances. I mean, it, it almost sounds crazy for me to say those words, but that's sort of what we're taught. So speak to that for a minute. Well, there's a lot of truth in that. So yes, there are neurotransmitter imbalances, and this has been well documented. Actually, the most popular antidepressant medications, the so-called SSRIs, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors like uh, Prozac and Zoloft and Celexa, those medications uh, um, uh, are designed to increase the activity of the neurotransmitter serotonin in the brain, which some people associate with happiness. And so that theory... Uh, about uh, serotonin deficit being a cause, a root cause of depression is very, very weak. Uh, and when you look at the best done studies about um, uh, these these types of antidepressants, the SSRIs, um, they, they can help about 50% of people, but in the fine print, what you find out is that that's only 10% more than placebo. Oh boy. So, um, and, and there are many, many other reasons uh, uh, why the serotonin deficit theory doesn't hold up. But um, th- there's a little bit of truth in it, and there's actually quite a bit of truth to the dopamine excess theory of, um, of schizophrenia. And there's uh, now this new theory, relatively new theory, which maybe your listeners haven't heard about. Uh, there's a neurotransmitter called glutamate, um, which is kind of the brain's gas pedal. And that neurotransmitter is found throughout the brain, widespread throughout the brain, whereas serotonin and dopamine are found just in certain places. Uh, and glutamate, it, the brain's gas pedal, is balanced by another equally um, uh, widespread neurotransmitter called GABA. And so those two, the balance between those two, help your brain uh, decide how active your brain is, the activity level of the brain. There's a lot of strong evidence coming out now that imbalances in the glutamate system are driving a lot of cases of depression Mm. um, and psychosis and even bipolar disorder. So yes, there are neurotransmitter imbalances, but what is causing them? That's what we always want to ask. Okay, you can add a medication to try to address the neurotransmitter imbalance, but that's not going to get to the root of the problem. It's not that you have, um, you know, a, a medication deficiency. Uh, what's right. wrong? Why are your neurotransmitters imbalanced? So, I could go into lots of biochemistry if you want about why that is, but I will just say one thing, and you can ask me more if you like, um, is that if you eat refined carbohydrates and seed oils, those cause inflammation and oxidation, and those turn on, um, those shift your chemistry around, uh, particularly along a particular pathway, away from serotonin towards dopamine, and 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 furthermore, you get you can get up to a hundred times your your normal glutamate level, wow. just by eating the wrong foods, primarily processed foods, particularly refined carbohydrates. If you want to unbalance your neurotransmitters, that's the best way to do it. Wow, that, that's impressive! Over a hundred fold just by eating the refined foods. That, that's pretty impressive. So so then, is that how a low carb diet works? Simply by avoiding uh, the refined carbohydrates and the vegetable oils, or because that would speak to, you know higher carb diets, but a, I guess a cleaner carb version could, 
work equally as well. So is there a need to differentiate between the two or do you think they can be equally effective in the right setting? Well, any change you make in the right direction is going to be a good one. So, you know, I, you know, I think start wherever you can yeah. and, and, and then make further changes as you go along, especially if you're not seeing the results you want. Um, I think a low carbohydrate diet is a very, very healthy diet for the brain um, because uh, when you eat a low carbohydrate diet, you may or may not go into ketosis. Um, but even if you don't go into ketosis, you have lowered, um, you have taken a lot of pressure off your brain to process all that excess sugar. Yeah. When you do, yes. And that's a great point. Mm -hmm. So, so do ketones matter? You know, they matter for a lot of things, but do they matter for trying to uh, treat depression or treat schizophrenia or treat anxiety? Do the ketone bodies actually matter or is it just the reduction of the glucose and the insulin? Do we know the answer to that question even? Well, theoretically, um, I, I could give you all kinds of theories about this, but um, we have very, very little clinical, ev a clinical yeah. documented, published clinical evidence on this. I can tell you my clinical experience and the experience of several other psychiatrists who are, who are working in this field is that for some people it does matter. For others, it doesn't. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, the, the diagnoses that, that get thrown around and lumped together frequently under psychiatric disorders are depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, anxiety, ADD. Do you sort of see them as fairly similar in terms of their response to carbohydrates and restriction of carbohydrates, or is there a little vari variation in them? There's a lot of variation uh, so, because, you know, it's not all about carbohydrates. It's not all about metabolism, although I think that, you know, that takes care of a lot of um, a lot of what we're trying to do in terms of address underlying causes, but um, there are also things like food sensitivities, mm -hmm. and um, in particular with ADHD, there's really nicely documented studies. Um, none of them done done in the United States, and all of them done you know the past 20, 30 years. Where if you take children with ADHD and you put them on a very simple diet, where you've eliminated all of the potential. Um, common allergens, you know, things, well, and, and, and most of the processed foods, and you just put them on, you know, meat and poultry and rice and vegetables and that sort of diet, um, uh, you get a two-thirds to three-quarters response rate, you know, kids actually improving, and many of them no longer meeting criteria for ADHD after just two or three weeks. Wow, that's remarkable. And that's not a low-carbohydrate diet. Right. So, All right, that's good to know. Yeah. So there's the treatment of... of quote unquote, psychiatric diseases where people are, are deemed to have a problem. And then there's this, this sort of, I guess I'd call it emerging society or emerging population of people who just want better brain function. They want to be more alert, um, better cognition. And, you know, ketosis has been promoted for that. And some people are, are using Ritalin for that or nicotine patches for that. Um, did, did you have experience with that, um, with people coming to you for that and wanting their Ritalin? Oh, yes. Yeah. So as a college psychiatrist, uh, especially in college mental health, I, um, uh, every day, um, more than once a day. Yeah. Students coming in saying, I can't concentrate. I right. can't get my work done. Uh, my memory isn't as good as it used to be in high school. And most of these students were earnest. Not all of them, You're right. but most of them. And I, I believed them. And, uh, and, and stimulants really do help um, most of those people very quickly. They often have side effects. Um, you can develop tolerance. You can even develop a certain sort of psychological dependence on them. But by and large they can be very helpful. The problem is, again, they're not addressing the root cause. And so, you know, long-term, you're just going to take uh, that medication for the rest of your life. Um, and, and, and again, they come with side effects. What happens mostly with the stimulants is that you get a kind of peaks and valleys in, in the, in, in your attention. And so you get, you get, you know, get hyper-focused and then you'll crash. Mm. So, uh, and there are all kinds of other side effects that can happen as well. But, you know, again, What's cause it? Why can't you concentrate? That's what I'm interested in. Right. Yeah. So you're not sleeping well, you're not managing your stress well, and you're eating too much junk food because you don't have the time to prepare your own meals and think about the quality of your food. And I mean, I've, those have to be the top three in, in most college kids, right? Absolutely. They're not getting enough sleep. They're eating the wrong food. They're under a yeah. tremendous amount of stress. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, well then after your time at Smith, you've made yet, you've made another transition. So tell us about your latest venture and what you've transitioned into. 
Yeah, so we made the very difficult decision to, to leave Smith uh, at the end of last spring, so I guess it was May or June. And and the reason I did that, there were many reasons, but the primary reason was the nutrition work that I'm so passionate about, the writing and speaking and studying nutrition uh, and the, the advocacy work just became very time consuming and, and I love doing it. And it was just, it was like I had two full-time jobs. And so I had to make a decision. And, you know, it was very difficult, as you mentioned, sort of alluded to before, it's hard to do good, really good nutrition work on a college campus. The environment really works against you and works again, not just against me, but against the students' best efforts as well. Students are required to eat in dining halls. There's no such thing as even a whole foods dining hall, let alone a low carb dining hall. Um, there are vegan dining halls and there are gluten-free dining halls um, and kosher dining halls, but there's no, not even a whole foods dining hall uh, if students want to improve the quality of their diet. So so now what I'm doing is a mixture of things, more writing, um, and uh, so, so more writing, more speaking. Um, I've started a, an online consultation service for people who are interested in talking to me about diet and mental health and any other aspect of health they're interested in, nutrition that they're interested in. And, uh, and I'm working on a book about nutrition and mental health, uh, many other sort of little projects um, on, you know, on the horizon. But I'm, I'm really enjoying it so far. Well, that's great because it, and it shows your sort of two hats or you're, you're multifaceted because you, you are an expert in psychiatric diseases and treating them both with medications and with nutrition, but you're also an expert in, um, evaluating nutritional science and evaluating nutritional reports. And I think that's where you've also shown your expertise and where people really look to your writings for guidance. And Mm -hmm. part of that has to, you know, part of that is represented in the talk you gave here at the conference at Low Carb Denver about the Eat Lancet report. So this has been a huge topic in the news over the past, I guess, month or so. Um, So give us a, you know, 30 second snippet of what the Eat Lancet report is, and then we'll go into your analysis a little bit deeper. Sure. So the Eat Lancet report was published in January in the uh, very prestigious medical journal, The Lancet. It was commissioned by The Lancet, and the it was written by 37 uh, researchers headed by a Harvard nutrition professor, uh, Dr. Walter Willett, who is arguably the most influential nutrition researcher in the world. And basically uh, what it is is a document that lays out the argument for a very low meat or perhaps even zero animal food diet in order to improve our health they claim save a million lives per year, and uh, to uh, protect the planet. And the the way this was publicized was that it was a um, science evidence based report on how meat is deleterious for our health and for the planet. Um, exactly. And do the claims are the claims backed by the uh, information in the report? Why they are not, <laughs> <laughs> and and I mean we we laugh, but but we see this time and time again that the you know the media overplays um, the results of a study or the you know the the social media just takes a, a snippet of something and runs with it. But this was a little bit different because this was actually um, promoted sort of by the people writing it, um, by the authors um, as being sort of the end all be all conclusive report. Um, and that's a little frustrating if the science doesn't back it up. So give us a couple examples of where you see the science falling short to back up that claim. Yeah. So there are many, many examples, but I I guess what I would say is that when they use the word science, scientific evidence, um, it, uh, that's really where I would take issue because the report relied very heavily, not exclusively, but very heavily on a certain kind of nutrition study called an epidemiological study. Uh, Professor Willett is a nutrition epidemiologist. He actually um, is considered to have invented this methodology as it applies to nutrition. And so he he obviously believes in the power of these studies. But but um, most of the studies used to back up the anti-meat claims are epidemiological studies. And these are not nutrition experiments. These are questionnaire-based guesses about food and health that then need to be tested in clinical trials. But un- unfortunately, they're usually touted as fact and published in headlines and written into our guidelines before they're even put to clinical trials. And when they are put to clinical trials, more than 80% of the time, those guesses about food and health were wrong. So you'd be better off flipping a coin. Um, so th- that's my main issue, uh, with the type of evidence they use. They did use other evidence, but whenever it contradicted their 
low meat, no meat plan, they dismissed it. Yeah, so you used a couple examples. I mean, eggs being a big one, poultry being another one where they they would cite evidence, to their credit, they would cite evidence that it's not been shown to be harmful in most populations. Um, so eggs being a big one, say their only caveat was in diabetics where they, you could say they cherry picked one study and, and ignored others, but they did say there's other evidence showing up to eating one egg a day was not harmful to your overall health. Yes. But then yet their recommendation was to eat like one egg a week, right? So how do they go from acknowledging the evidence that it's not harmful to then making that such a low recommendation? It doesn't fit. It does not fit. And it's just, it's, it's a really good example of bias. Um, it, you know, how can you in the same breath say all of these studies showed that this was perfectly fine, but we're going to recommend a lot less than that. Right. And then there was this other conflict about, is this about health or is this about the environment? And it certainly seemed like they were saying both that this is what's necessary to sustain health and to sustain the, sustain the environment. But then yet now there's this quote from the scientific, the, the scientific lead, I guess, of this saying, oh, it was never about the environment. Do you, do you know more about that? Because I found that very confusing. I do. Uh, so the report is 47 pages long. Only 11 pages, pages of it is dedicated to nutrition. The rest is all about environmental impact. So if they're saying that it wasn't about the environment, then that doesn't square. But, um, you know, what happened was, uh, uh, you know, I'm not qualified to talk about sustainability. It's a very, very complicated topic. So I reached out to other people who, who might know something. And I reached out to people of different, with different biases. And what they pointed out to me, one, one person in particular, Dr. Frank Mintloner from UC Davis, um, he, he pointed me to the table in, in the sustainability section of the report that was trying to show that eating less meat or perhaps no meat would be better for the planet. And they looked at all these different environmental outcomes. The only, and, and these are estimated projections because we don't know what would happen. Of course, these are models. Um, these are, again, sort of guesses. And so they were guessing if they did everything just right and you ate this different diet, that greenhouse gases would go down. Um, and in all of the other things they looked at, water quality and pollution and things like that, nothing else changed when you lowered your meat intake. But greenhouse gases seemed to go down and that we want that, right? That's good. Um, so when Dr. Mintloner wrote to uh, the scientific director at Eat Lancet and said, he, he was taking issue with the way the calculations had been done and wanted to know what model they'd been using because he wasn't sure if it was correct. And instead of, um, you know, answering him about that, they wrote back and said, well, we're not, we didn't base our, our dietary recommendations on sustainability. This is completely about nutrition and health. So that was concerning. <laughs> that is concerning. And I, gosh, I mean, I don't want to fall into just everything is, is biased and they, they just had a mission from the beginning and they were, you know, just trying to confound people and confuse people to just believing. But it certainly seems like that's, that was a big part of their mission. And, and I, I wish it wasn't, but it's hard to find the other side of this. It is hard. And it's partly because they're not transparent. So I have a bias. You have a bias. We all, you know, all of us as human beings are biased. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and you actually can't avoid it. But you should be aware of it and you should be transparent about it because that way people know where you're coming from. So if you are Dr. Walter Willett and you say, you know what, I, I don't, I'm not comfortable with the idea of eating animals. I don't eat animals myself. I mean, I don't know if this is true of him. I'm just saying hypothetically, if this were the case, couldn't he say, we well, you know this is what I believe is best. This is what I, you know, I worry about. I'm worried about how animals are treated. I don't personally believe that it's good for us to eat animals. I worry about, you know, how they might be affecting our health, even though I can't, I'm finding lots of evidence to the contrary, wrestle with it openly. And, and, and I think actually the emotional argument is a very valid one. Uh, so I don't, you know, I don't know why they need feel the need to at least seemingly hide behind nutrition science uh, when there really isn't any nutrition science there. Yeah, that's the most troubling part of this whole thing is, is displaying something as factual, displaying something as conclusive when really it's anything but. And that, that confuses a lot of people. I'm sure you've seen this. I've seen people who just come to you like desperate. I'm so confused because I've seen so many contradictory things. And this is part of the reason for that is overstating the quality of evidence or, or the certainty of evidence. Yeah, you know, when you were mentioning that, you know, the that the media plays a role in this, and, and I agree that they do, because often they'll just repeat the headline or the press release that the authors or the or the journal have have given to them. But in a certain way, 
how would they do it all? I mean, it, it takes so long to read. It took me a week to read the 11 pages in any, in a full week, a full, full time, a full week's work to read those 11 pages and try to understand uh, what the arguments were. No journalist has that kind of time or, or the, the, uh, the ability to do that. And if you were still practicing in full-time psychiatry, there's no way you would have had time for no. that. So you know, we're lucky to have you that, that you were able to do it. Well, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> You have a twisted sense of fun. I, I do. Think. <laughs> I need to get out more. <laughs> so, so what would you recommend to people? I mean, what can we do now that this is out there and it sort of has the steam behind it? And but yet, what what can we do to help ourselves interpret what it means or to kind of help counteract it? That's the you know million dollar question. I really don't know. I'm you know I'm I'm not I'm not somebody who knows a lot about politics or power or how financial power works. Um, uh, there are other people who do understand those things, or, or even the legalities and politics of this. I really focus so much on the science that it's hard for me to even start to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. But what I do notice is that this effort um, to uh, reduce or eliminate animal foods from the from the diet of everyone living on the planet is very well funded and very well organized and very powerful. And so, you know. It, it, it has the potential to affect everybody's food choices, how much food costs, what foods are available. If they're successful, this could have major consequences for us, for everyone, whether you eat plants or animals or both. And so I, I do think that people who care about nutrition science, not just low-carb people, because this isn't about low-carb and high-carb. This, this is about public health, and this is about social justice. And so if you care about this, we need to find a way to organize better, join forces with other communities, not just the low-carb community, but other communities which are interested in health, and find a way to uh, send a more cohesive message um, and uh, spread a different, a different um, spread more information, sort of at least be able to lay out arguments to the contrary yeah. so that people can ha see both sides of it and decide for themselves. Yeah, that's a good point. And you, you know what, you... you hinted on this and I meant to bring this up, the point about um, nutritional completeness, right? So we need to organize better, like you were saying, and not just low carb. I think that message is so important. But one of the messages can be which di what diet is more complete and is this a complete diet that we can all thrive on? And the answer there is no. I mean, it's a really incomplete diet, isn't it? Uh, by their own admission, repeatedly throughout these 11 pages, and I would encourage people who are curious to just read them, it's, um, but uh, repeatedly uh, throughout the report, they acknowledge that the, the, diet, the diet that they're recommending, the, the diet they're recommending is between, let's say, let's give an example, seven grams of red meat per day, which is a quarter of an ounce. Quarter of an ounce. That's the size of the top of your thumb. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, uh, or less than that, right? So you can have, you can have up to two, you can have up to a whole thumb's worth, or you can have no thumbs at all, right. um, worth of red meat. So, you know, that diet that they're recommending, um, hmm, I lost my train of thought on the, I lost, I forgot the question, Brett, because <laughs> I was so excited about describing this piece of meat. <laughs> it was about the completeness of the diet. Or, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> There's a good description about the piece of meat, though. You can picture that. The, the, com the complete. So they repeatedly acknowledge uh, for pregnant women, for 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 infants, for growing children, for the malnourished, for the impoverished, for teenage girls, um, that that this diet uh, for for aging adults who are losing muscle mass, for all of these people, the the diet, even their middle diet with the sort of um, not zero meat but a little bit of meat, is uh, nutritionally inadequate and appropriate, and that you need to take not just B12 supplements, but other supplements on top of that, like iron and B2, um, perhaps omega-3. And so um, by their own admission, the diet is insufficient. And then, of course, there's insulin resistance, which, you know, now in the United States we know, and this is around the world, many places as well, only one in eight of us are metabolically healthy now. So the Lancet diet recommends a very high carbohydrate diet on average, 330 grams of carbohydrate per day. Wow. And for somebody with insulin resistance, uh, that's going to be a dangerous diet. So this diet really isn't appropriate for anyone I can think of. <laughs> 
So it would be the 12% of the population that's metabolically healthy, but who is not an elderly adult or who's not pregnant or who's not a teenager, or who's not growing, nobody who wants to grow or be healthy, essentially. That's right. And for those people that you just mentioned, that, that very small slice of the population, even they would have to take supplement, particularly B12 supplement. And, and that's a choice that you can make if you wish to. But you should know that, um, first of all, there are other supplements you need to take. They really downplay the nutritional deficiencies. Um, and, you know, but you should know that, that that's, in my opinion, based on everything I've read, a, a vegan diet is not a healthier diet. Um, simply removing the animal foods from your diet, um, there's no proof, there's no evidence that only removing the animal foods from your diet will get you healthier in any way. And um, all we know is that if you remove the animal foods and you remove all the processed foods, then you get a little bit healthier. <laughs> right. And that's a, that's a very important point because people will cite evidence saying going on a, a vegan or vegetarian diet is proven to be beneficial for our health. But that's the caveat. You're not just removing the meat. You're also removing the processed food, the junk food, the refined sugars. Hard to argue with that. But the question of if you're just removing meat, that's really unanswered. It's never been tested. So yeah. we have absolutely no idea what happens if you simply take whatever diet you're eating now and just remove the animal foods from it. Um, we have no idea if you'd see any health benefits whatsoever. Yeah. Well, it's, it's certainly disturbing um, to, to see the way things are promoted with the lack of scientific security behind it, um, or scientific certainty, I should say, behind it. Mm -hmm. Well, on that depressing topic, let's transition <laughs> to a, another exciting topic, Alzheimer's disease oh, and dementia. Yes. All right. So... Are the baby boomers are aging. They happen to be a higher percentage of overweight and insulin resistant baby boomers. And there's this fear that Alzheimer's disease is going to skyrocket. And it is a devastating disease, not just for the person affected, but the, the loved ones, the caretakers, the family, and of course, economically. Yeah. So it's a brain disease. You are an expert in brain diseases. What do you see as, again, a kind of root cause, common theme with Alzheimer's disease in a way to potentially attack it? So, with, you know, we were talking before about, you know, psychiatric disorders and, um, and low-carbohydrate diets, and we have very, very little evidence there. It's emerging about insulin resistance and psychiatric disorders, but when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, we have multiple lines of high-quality, mature scientific evidence all pointing in uh, in the direction of um, insulin resistance being not just associated with Alzheimer's disease, an innocent bystander, but actually being a driving force behind most cases of Alzheimer's disease. Um, uh, this is th this is most brain experts now um, agree on this point. Now, what, what what level of evidence is that? I mean, because it's hard to do a randomized controlled trial, right? So that's the highest level of ev evidence. So I would guess it's not, it's not quite to that degree. So what level of evidence do you think supports it? Right. So we're not talking about epidemiology. We're talking about mechanistic studies. We're talking about um, we're talking about imaging studies. We're talking about clinical studies, humans, animals, mechanistic studies, basic science experiments. Every kind of evidence, every type of evidence that you can have that isn't a randomized clinical trial is there. And it's not, it, you, you wouldn't want to point to any one of these types of lines of evidence, but be, because all of them point in the same direction and they're all very strong uh, types of, uh, the study results are all very strong, um, then you really have a good case. And, and it has started to be tested um, in, in clinical trials. We have a few studies that have come out showing that if you uh, eat a low-carbohydrate diet, even if you have early Alzheimer's disease, you can start to see little changes in cognitive um, in uh, cognitive function. So, and there are a lot more studies to come. It's a really active area of research, but um, it really makes sense because Alzheimer's disease is basically the brain uh, is dying and uh, it's a metabolic disorder. The brain's not getting enough energy. It's an energy crisis. Right. So the funny thing about it is that yes, the, the brain needs sugar, and even if you've got a lot of sugar, even if you have high blood sugar, you know, that's all going to, sugar has no problem going into the brain. It flows in, no questions asked. If your bl blood sugar is 400, you have plenty of blood sugar, nothing's going to stop that. The problem is if you have insulin resistance of the body, um, you will also have it at the blood-brain barrier, and then the insulin won't be able to cross into the brain, and you need insulin to process glucose and turn it into energy. 
So the brain um, is uh, uh, suffering from an energy deficit. An energy deficit despite the substrate for the energy, the glucose being prevalent everywhere. Exactly. It's yeah. flooded with glucose and yet it's still starving to death. So that's the, the, the thing that people understand. They think, oh, the brain needs sugar. Well, yes, the brain does need some sugar, but, um, uh, you know, uh, it's not uh, having, getting it up there isn't all that needs to happen. Right. And yet there have been hundreds of millions of dollars spent on Alzheimer's drugs and medications but none of them looking at insulin resistance. Do you see the, the tide starting to change? Do you think there's going to start to be a shift? There have been uh, actually some studies. Uh, because as soon as they they as soon as scientists and the scientific community noticed this very strong connection between insulin resistance and Alzheimer's, the first thing most of them did was think, "Oh, we need a drug for that." So <laughs> they started to test um, uh, insulin resistance uh, medica medications that can can lower insulin resistance, and so some of them have worked, some of them have not. Uh, th this is very very early, but there actually are studies out there um, looking at this. So. So, um, but I would argue again, you know, like, why do you, why do you have insulin resistance in the first place? Um, rather than use a drug, why not try to lower your insulin levels naturally by changing your diet? Right. It just makes so much sense. It makes doesn't so it? much sense. <laughs> yeah. Now, would you recommend that someone has to be on a ketogenic diet to prevent Alzheimer's or, tr or to treat Alzheimer's? Or do you think, again, just getting off of the high carbohydrate low glycemic index refined sugars is enough to make an improvement. Like how do we know where we're getting a, a benefit and how much effort is needed? We don't know. Uh, it's a really good question. So, I mean, it really is a matter of degree. So how insulin resistant you are. I mean, this is my hypothesis. I want to make cl clear that this is a hypothesis. This is not fact. I don't know for sure. But uh, if it follows the trends of lots of other diseases, uh, as we look at, you know, sugar metabolism and ketosis is that the more insulin resistant you are, the the more strict you're likely going to need to be. And so it's not a one size fits all. But if you have uh, pre-Alzheimer's, which is a mild cognitive impairment, or early Alzheimer's, chances are, and you can get tested to be to find out, because not everybody with Alzheimer's has insulin resistance, just 80% of them do. Um, only 80%. Only 80%. Yeah. Um, get, you know, if you have insulin resistance, um, it's probably uh, pretty significant. Yeah. And so, you know, it, start wherever you can. You know, if you can, if you can do ketosis, do it. If you, if you need to work your way down to that, that and see how, you know, I think everybody's a little bit different, but I, I think that it's really important to make the changes that you're capable of making because it certainly can't hurt. Right. I think that's a refreshing to hear, to hear the way you explain things because you, you admit when you know what you know and you admit you don't know what you don't know and you admit where you're not an expert and where you need to rely on others. And it, it's refreshing to hear that because especially something like the Eat Lancet or, you know, other people who, who sort of kind of expouse about a lot of different topics where maybe they're not an expert or are saying things with a certainty that, that doesn't exist. So it's refreshing to hear that acknowledgement about what you know and what you don't know. There's a lot I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Humility is, is a good thing, I oh, think. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, it's fun to look, keep learning though. That's the thing. You know, it's the, one of the things I love about it is that there's so much more to learn and every day there's something new that I can discover. Right. Well, we've walked through a number of different brain related conditions and then quality of science related conditions, which both I, I would definitely consider you an expert on. Uh, so what's next for you and what else would you, would you think needs exploration? Lauren here. Well, actually, when, what I'm learning about now, I, I just uh, I just spoke yesterday at the world's first carnivore conference, and so uh, I spoke about the potential for car like why might carnivore diets be good for the brain? We hear anecdotes all the time, uh, people saying that their long-standing mental illness of whatever type uh, mysteriously disappeared on a carnivore diet or significantly improved. And so, you know, the question is, uh, if we believe these people, um, why would that be? Why would that be? Why right? would that we be? So I'm looking into that. We had uh, Amber O'Hearn on the uh, on the podcast, and she gave a, a wonderful discussion and about uh, carnivore diet. So, what are some of your theories? What do you What are you playing with at the moment for why it would work? Yeah. So, in my talk yesterday, I explored some of these things, but when, as I was preparing for it, I realized how much I didn't know. You uh, know, I thought, oh, there's so many other things I'd like to learn. But uh, what I did, uh, what I presented yesterday was uh, th sort of a. Th there are three. There are three underlying reasons for pretty much any illness, right? Their toxicity, deficiency, and what I call metabolic mayhem, right? And so pretty much every disease can be boiled down to one of those three or all three. And so if you're eating um, only meat, 
What you're doing is you're eating a food which contains every nutrient we need in its proper form mm. without any anti-nutrients. All, many plants contain substances which interfere with our, with our ability to use nutrients. And all plants are missing certain essential nutrients. There is no such thing as a complete plant food that gives you all the food, all nutrients you need. So um, you're getting all the nutrients you need and you're not getting any anti-nutrients, so that's good. So you, you, nutritionally, you're, you're, you're good. Um, but uh, you, you're also reducing drastically the number of toxins in your diet because plants defend themselves using chemical weapons. Those are natural toxins. I want to make this clear. We have evolved mechanisms to deal with those toxins in many cases, not all, in many cases. And so it's not as though, you know, everyone's going to die if they eat plants. Clearly that's not the case. Not the case. But for so many of us, we have sustained damage in our gut or immune system over time from who knows what, environmental insults, toxins, pesticides, antibiotics, drugs, who knows what things in the environment. And we are, we've lost our ability to manage those toxins because in most cases we've evolved to either not absorb them in the first place or rapidly detoxify and eliminate them very, very quickly. So um, if that's not, if, you, if you're not able to do that, those toxins get in and there's some really powerful toxins in plants that can penetrate the blood brain barrier. Mm. And then the third is what we've been talking about is metabolic mayhem. So if you eat an all meat diet, you're not eating, you're eating very, very little carbohydrate if you're eating all meat diet. And so then of course that can really, it's been shown by many of us, including the wonderful Dave Feldman in meticulous uh, experiments. And I've done this myself. Blood sugar is stone cold flat. And, and nice and low, like you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, on a low carb, on, on a on a carnivorous diet, which actually was not the case for me on a ketogenic diet. Interesting. So yeah. it's very good for for if if you've got fluctuating blood sugar and insulin levels. So it suggests though that there could be a a damaged process in the gut that could heal, and then potentially you will be able to tolerate plants in the future. Potentially, I think that's something that'll be really interesting to see as this sort of carnivore community grows. And if some people try to go back to a keto diet or you know lower carb, but still with plants, if they then do better on it. Um, Exactly. I wish if you ever find out how to do that, if, you know, to improve my metabolism and 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 uh, health, so that I can uh, uh, expand my diet. Please let me know. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's limiting. It can be very socially limiting and and, and difficult in certain situations, and but but still perfectly doable because there's a growing number of people doing it. Yeah, and, and you had asked what what's next, and so I'm, I'm, I'm intellectually that's an, an an area of interest for me. Um, I'm learning more about the biochemistry of the brain and the endocannabinoid system and things like that, just for my own interest. But uh, um, we're gonna—I don't know if you know about this—but um, there's going to be the first ever low carb conference in Asia. Uh, next month in Indonesia and Jakarta. Oh, right. So I'll be there. Dr. Westman will be there. Oh, fantastic. Gary Fecky will be there, Tasmania. And um, and then in Switzerland, there'll be a conference, a, a Keto Live conference in Burgund, Switzerland. And uh, Dr. Thomas Seifried will be there. Ivor Cummins will be there. There's just many, many people. So it's going to be wonderful. Wow. Um, this low carb um, Science community is really growing, and the message is spreading to you know more and more places around the world, and more and more people are are learning about it as an option. So I think it's great. I like how you said that as an option, right? Doesn't mean it's right for everybody, exactly. but certainly be a, a potential tool in the toolbox for everybody. Doesn't mean it's right for everybody, but right. Well, I really appreciate your approach um, and the way you see things and explain things. So thank you for all you're doing, and thank you for all your work, and thank you for continuing to try and learn more and sort of be better and help educate the rest of us. I really appreciate that. Thanks for an, a great conversation and your excellent questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dr. Georgia Ede from diagnosisdiet.com. Thank you very much. Thank you.